Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. I think that we all kind of still have our brains still left over at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. Getting through it, but we have to kind of catch up soon, huh? Also, here is Clark Wolf. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Good to be back on Movie yeah. Talk. And Mark Ellis. Never had a brain to begin with, Dennis. Don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. Didn't go to Comic-Con, didn't come back from Comic-Con. All right, let's get started with the first topic, which we have to warn you is going to be spoiler heavy. Uh, Sinead, what is it? Yes, massive spoiler alerts on the way for Suicide Squad. So for everyone not wanting to know any more details about the August 5th release, mute your computers or skip ahead. And we're going to throw up a spoiler alert graphic right now. Ching, 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 ching. Just pretend it's there. <laughs> it's there. I see it. This is your warning. <laughs> All right, okay, so according to THR, due to a last minute bout of filming, The Flash will be making an appearance in Suicide Squad, Warner Brothers heavily hyped DC movie opening in just one week. THR sources say Ezra Miller, Ezra Miller recently wrapped shooting a scene that will be inserted into the movie, but it is unclear whether the scene was shot in April when the movie underwent over a week of reshoots or more recently. The scene will not be an end credit insert, but in the movie itself. The addition of The Flash late in the process shows just how how essential the character is in the DC Excited universe as he is a character who can tie many threads together. As for the scene itself and how it relates to the story of Suicide Squad remains to be seen. Dennis, what do you think about the last minute addition to Suicide Squad? Well, when I first heard that, I immediately thought it was a post credits or mid credits type of scene because, you know, adding something into the middle of the film is a little dangerous when you've already got the film shot and edited and mostly plotted out and this you know, The Flash is, I think, a character from the, the Justice League Comic-Con trailer that got actually a very positive reaction from most of the fans, the look of him, and even just kind of maybe the comedic tones that we haven't seen before in the DC Universe. So them adding him to it, it's not too surprising, but it may be a little dangerous. It may, like, throw people off while watching it. Mark? Uh, you know, the one thing that Suicide Squad needs when you look at all that cast is one more person in the movie. <laughs> okay. You know, that's what I'm begging for is like 18 isn't enough. We need a sweet, we need a nice round number of 19 people that we've heard of in this movie. I'm fine with it. It doesn't really get on my radar either way because it's not like the Flash is going to have a huge presence in this movie. It's going to be one scene in all likelihood is going to be a short scene, but I loved what I saw of the Flash in Justice League from that little snippet we saw at Comic-Con. So anything the Flash wants to pop in into over the next couple of years until we get to see him in his own movie and in Justice League. I'm on board for it. Let's bring it on, Ezra. Clark? It sounds like a strategic move, I think, on DC's part, considering that they had just, you know, released this footage and they probably knew that they would be releasing this footage. So in order to get fans even more familiar with this character, plus consider that, you know, the DC TV universe, the fans, some fans are already um, used to Grant Gustin as their Flash. So it's like, it's good probably to get Ezra out there at, in this role in front of the audience. So I think it makes kind of sense mm -hmm. so that's good i think you make a good point about trying to get that in the the fans minds like okay here's another flash mm -hmm. so let's show him as much as possible do you think it's it's possible that i you know i haven't seen the movie yet is it an actual flash cameo or is it just barry allen could you see them just doing like a mm. 30 seconds of just Barry Allen in there, or do you think it has to be the well, Flash? It would be harder to do an actual Flash cameo because yeah. you have to incorporate some sort of effects or at least get him in the costume and stuff. So I would imagine it's just Barry Allen, but he is playing the Flash, so you're going to get hints of who he really is. Well, wouldn't that be a big surprise or a big reveal, too, to see Ezra Miller in the suit mm -hmm. in Suicide Squad? Like I feel like that's something that maybe DC would hold for another time. Well, I mean, we saw the suit in the in Did the Justice, Justice League, remember. but it was a kind of a more of a robotic look to it. The question right. is, you know, that I'm assuming Suicide Squad takes place before Justice League. And so if you see that that Justice League footage, you'll see when Bruce Wayne comes in there that there is a flash suit already in his basement. Mm -hmm. But we don't know if it's like that souped up robotic right. version or like one that he had himself. So maybe we'll see that old version in Suicide Squad. Maybe I'm making a bigger deal than it is. And it's like Ezra Miller pops in for like 10 seconds, says, hey, guys, blah, blah, blah. And then it and might the actually be him stealing milk from a convenience store, like not on closed circuit security camera footage. Like, like the scene that oh, we saw actual, in oh, Batman v Superman, 
might just be him actually lifting something, and maybe that's it. If I called that, then, uh, whoo, finally, I got something right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? While Universal is conjuring up their monster shared universe, Lionsgate is also getting into the game with a feature film adaptation of the BBC One series, Jekyll. Now they've set their sights on Captain America himself, Chris Evans, who is eyeing the lead role as a brilliant doctor with a murderous split personality. Deadline reports the movie will be based on the Stephen Moffat penned TV miniseries of the same name, which followed the last living descendant of the mythical Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who attempts to keep his violent superhuman alter ego in check with cutting edge technology and modern medicine. James Nesbitt originated the role in the series, which saw the two personalities trying to coexist, even though one doesn't remember what the other does while in control of the body. The new movie creates a potential collision course between the dueling projects, with Universal already setting Russell Crowe to play the character, first in The Mummy opposite Tom Cruise, and presumably as a standalone in a later film. With Jekyll, no release date has been set. Clark, do you think this version of Jekyll will be able to compete with Universal's version? I think so. I mean, I think, first of all, we're not going to get a standalone Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde movie for a long, long time. Um, also, I think that Russell Crowe is such a different casting decision than Chris Evans. So I don't see the audience being confused or, or not being able to accept both of them. Um, also, in, in terms of tone, I mean, Stephen Moffat, you know, gosh, he's so beloved by his BBC uh, cohort. So I would imagine that... That whatever uh, whatever Universal is doing, which I would imagine is more action heavy, uh, is going to be a, a lot different than anything Stephen Moffat would have put together. Which I would imagine I, I haven't seen the miniseries that it's based on, uh, but I would imagine is is completely different. So I don't think audiences are going to have a hard time keeping these separate. And also, look, I mean, more monsters, yes, please. Nobody <laughs> nobody has to twist my arm to to watch more <laughs> monsters, especially when they're very handsome like Chris Evans. Mark. I want to see Chris Evans in this role, so I'm going to be excited about it. You know, I, I don't know that we need a, a thousand different Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movies, but if you have one that's attached to a larger shared universe, there's certain constraints you're going to have. Whereas with this one, you can go anywhere you want. It's like what Clark said. It can be darker. It can be grittier with Stephen Moffat behind it. It sounds like something that's intriguing. And for Chris Evans, Captain America, to take on a role which is totally different from that in both in tone and in scope, I would look forward to seeing this movie. It's not going to confuse me. Maybe not everybody is going to want to see a bunch of different versions of these classic monster movies, but I'd be up for a different Dracula. I'd be up for another take on Frankenstein that isn't a part of the Universal Shared franchise because as a fan of these kind of stories, you don't want to hedge all your bets and put everything into... You do want to hedge your bets, I guess. You don't want everything to be locked into one universe going forward. So now we have more chances to enjoy these characters. I'm in. I, th I think it can work. And like you said, the, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Universal one probably won't be out for a while. As long as they can beat them to the punch, have this movie out. You know, for the TV series, I haven't watched it, but, you know, Stephen Moffat, he does Sherlock, he does Doctor Who. People mm -hmm. love him. I feel bad for the TV actor who played Jekyll, though. <laughs> yeah, no like, kidding. It's like, hey, we're making a live action movie of your film. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be huge. By the way, you're not in it. Uh, we had to get someone else. And, and you can play the butler. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Come on. Maybe a cameo. Yeah. And, you know, and Chris Evans is kind of an unconventional choice for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is, you know, you know, the, I think of obviously someone like Mark Ruffalo who plays the Incredible Hulk, which is based on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So I just don't see him in that. But he, I think he's a talented actor and, and I want to see what he does with it. Well, one thing I forgot to mention is um, if you look at Chris Evans in something like Snowpiercer mm -hmm. or he's also in Sunshine, Danny Boyle's oh, movie yeah, Sunshine movie. And, and playing much darker, uh, a little more sinister characters in those roles. But then also obviously is Cap and, you know, does romantic comedies and things like that. So actually he is a versatile actor. He's just been doing these roles in much a smaller capacity. So I'm excited to see him because he's kind of flown under the radar until Cap made him kind of a household name. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing a, a darker side from him. Check out that movie Puncture that he's in. He stars in a movie called Puncture. It's a really small movie, but it really showcases Chris Evans' acting chops. Nobody's ever heard of it. It's okay. It's called Puncture. You'll thank me later. <laughs> and then the first movie I ever saw Chris Evans in was not another teen movie. Yeah. That's uh, like always whenever I see, even as Captain America, I still picture him from, <laughs> from that film. I like him in What's Your Number with Anna Faris. He's really, he's her, he's her romantic lead in that movie. And he's really charming and very, very funny. Is that the last romantic comedy that he's done? Because I, I don't think he's done one in well, a while, Well, he did right? that one that he directed, uh, which is, I don't know, he meets a girl on a train or something like that. That's more of a straight drama, I think. 
the, Snow with Piercer. a little bit of comedic Snow elements. <laughs> yeah, Snowpiercer. It's just a heartwarming family yes. film. All right, guys. Now we're on to buy or sell. Sinead, what do we got first? Back in 2012, just a couple of months before Disney purchased Lucasfilm for all the money in the world, the studio set its sights on a different kind of franchise reboot, The Rocketeer. At the time, the Mouse House was in the early stages of rebooting the 1930s set adventure film, but when the Lucasfilm deal happened, Star Wars became the focus instead. But now, plans are back in motion with THR reporting that a Rocketeer sequel is in the works with Disney hiring Max Winkler and Matt Spicer to pen the script called The Rocketeers. The film is envisioned as a sequel reboot with a modern day twist, setting a new hero as the Rocketeer, led by, led by a black female character. The original movie was based on a popular 1980s comic that followed a stunt pilot who discovers a rocket pack and suit and subsequently becomes embroiled with Nazis and mobsters. Disney says the Rocketeers will maintain its period setting, picking up six years after the events of the first with Campbell's Secord having vanished after fighting Nazis. The synopsis reads, an unlikely new hero emerges, a young African-American female pilot pilot who takes up the mantle of Rocketeer in an attempt to stop an ambitious and corrupt rocket scientist from stealing jetpack technology in what could prove to be a turning point in the Cold War. Mark, do you buy or sell a Rocketeer sequel from Disney? Yeah, it sounds cool. It's long overdue, and I like the way they're going with it. I like that it's going to be, it sounds like after World War II, so then you get into Cold War stuff and a little more espionage and under the radar things going on, and I think it's a great new twist to put on it with the, if you have a black female lead picking up the mantle of the Rocketeer here it's called the rocketeers maybe there's multiple ones it sounds like the right way to go i like that we don't know what happened to secret i like that it just kind of vanished maybe he does pop in somewhere maybe we get some more news as to what happened after the end of the first rocketeer when i was a kid i remember seeing the rocketeer and being like this is really cool just doesn't it doesn't feel like the effects were were, were ready to be able to pull off a story like that now they are and so i'm very excited to see this clark yeah, I agree. Um, I, I remember watching The Rocketeer when I was a kid, but I haven't seen it since. My friend Annette is going to kill me for saying that because she, it's her favorite movie. But um, but I, I love the idea of, of switching up the casting a little bit, and it sounds like we're going to have a team element with The Rocketeers being involved. And also, I mean, I, I think it's awesome. Yes, let's give a, a African-American or a black woman a lead role in an action movie. Love it. For me, while I love the design of the Rocketeer, I'm gonna sell this for now, just because it's a movie I remember seeing when I was younger, uh, and I thought it was okay. The only reason I really saw it was because I had a crush on Jennifer Connelly, who I had seen in Career Opportunities yeah. like a few months before. And then I, I, I do love the design of it. I just don't know. It, it, it cost I think forty million dollars to make and only made forty six million at the box office i just don't know if there's a clamoring i have no problem with the the black female lead as the rocketeer i just don't know if there's a clamoring for this franchise you know like where we just had ghostbusters right ghostbusters a beloved franchise that that has kind of stood through the the uh, test of time where rocketeer is kind of more of a cult thing that people like and less people know about the rocketeer i could be wrong maybe the trailer comes out and i think it's going to be awesome i think the rocketeer is one of those things where people just they're starting to remember oh yeah i saw that movie when i was a kid there's going to be more of a nostalgia factor now than there was in the late 90s say i look at this like tron mm -hmm. when they tried to reboot tron and like i, I had heard of tron it, i missed them I, Mar I was i was born too late to really get into the first tron where maybe they didn't have the effects at the time but it was kind of a cool story and people were like oh yeah that was a movie let's see what we can do with it now that reboot didn't work out as well as they wanted it to hopefully it's a different story with the rocketeers because there is a there are people out there. there's a generation of people that they may not walk around waving the rocketeer flag mm -hmm. like they do ghostbusters but they remember it and they might want to explore more lore in the universe I'm not a fan of that name either, though, the Rocketeer. It just sounds like a cheerleading squad or something like that. But 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 Rocket is also in there. Okay. So Rocket so Raccoon. Rockets from, from, are from, 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 no, oh. no no no. There's no. I thought Guardians in there. of the Galaxy. This tie maybe in. a ties in. Tie maybe in. maybe it's, it's all tie Disney, in. right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. What's next? The sequel for Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins Returns, is loading up with some major star power. In addition to Emily Blunt playing the central caretaker with co-star and Hamilton creator Lin-Manuel Miranda, Variety now reports that director Rob Marshall and Blunt will re-team with their Into the Woods star, Meryl Streep. 
According to the report, Streep is said to play the role of Poppins' cousin Topsy, who wasn't in the original 1964 adaptation. In this new version, the story will take place in Depression-era London, when the books were originally written, and follows a now-grown Jane and Michael Banks, who, along with Michael's three children, are visited by Mary Poppins following a personal loss. Through her unique magical skills and with the aid of her friend Jack, she helps the family rediscover the joy and wonder missing in their lives. Streep, Blunt, and Miranda will also sing for the movie, which will feature a new score by Hairspray's Mark Shaman. Mary Poppins Returns is dated for Christmas 2018. Dennis, do you buy or sell Meryl Streep in Mary Poppins Returns? Well, of course I buy it. It's Meryl Streep. She's going to be added, you know, one of the greatest uh, female actresses of all time to this movie. She's worked with Rob Marshall before in Into the Woods, which I thought was okay. Emily Blunt was also in that movie, so I think she's a great addition. It sounds a little dark in the beginning, like they're in the Depression era, there's a personal loss, hopefully they can you know, you know, make it a lot happier than that. But just the name of her character, what, what's her name? Top, Topsy? Topsy. It reminds me of, uh, remember in The Simpsons when they had the Itchy and Scratchy show and they added <laughs> Poochie? They had Poochie to that? That's what this sounds like to me. Just the name. It's like, oh, Mary Poppins has a cousin. His name Topsy. It was just throw her throw in there. Uh, but but I, I will buy this, Mark. You get into dangerous territory when you're adding a cousin to something yeah. that's already beloved. It didn't really work out for the Brady Bunch. Didn't they add Oliver? Yes. I'm, I, I'm sure Gazoo was a cousin to somebody on the Flintstones. Like It doesn't work <laughs> out well in history. Having said that, and having been not the biggest supporter of a Mary Poppins reboot, which I got so much hate for, <laughs> all I said was that I'm not sure that I needed a new Mary Poppins. I'm not going to get excited about well, well, this. Well, I also heard you hated the Wonder Woman trailer as I well, just, right? I just hate everything. I literally hate everything. I like the new Wonder Woman trailer a lot, and I think that adding Meryl Streep to this is a good move. Why? Because it's Meryl Streep. Like, you're doing a good thing by adding her to the cast. It's interesting she's going to be singing in it because she also is in a movie coming out a couple weeks called Florence Foster Jenkins where she plays an opera singer who cannot sing all that well <laughs> and she just has a dream to be a singer. But Meryl Streep, look, she learned how to crush a guitar solo for Ricky and the Flash. So I'm pretty sure she's going to be able to belt out a couple songs here and there. Having her with Emily Blunt, it's a great cast. It's just nothing is... You could put Van Damme in this movie and I'd be like, I'm not sure I'm going to get that excited <laughs> about another Mary Poppins movie. I, I would see that, though, if Van Damme was The in Topsy there. character, would, when we did Collider News this morning, Topsy is in the original book, and okay. it's Topsy-Turvy. So she is actually part of the Is story. she That's part of canon? Yeah, is she part of Mary Poppins canon though? <laughs> what about the name though? Mary Poppins Returns, like Batman Returns. Uh -huh. Well, like that's yeah. these are that's what I was actually just looking up. Uh, Sinead is is these are you know we can't forget that yes, while the original film is completely beloved and a yeah. cinema classic, especially in the Disney canon, uh, you know these are books. This is a series of books, and in fact, you know, and not just from you know saving Mr. Banks. P.L. Travers was not thrilled with the way the first movie came out. Talk about dark. Like these are dark books, and she did that on purpose um there's a broadway musical that that started in london that when i first saw it i was like this is messed <laughs> up what is going on but it's because it was mostly influenced by the books and it sounds like that's where they're going for this movie which i think is smart because you're never going to outdo julie andrews and dick van dyke dancing with cartoon penguins like oh. that's that's a, it's a time and a place and a sweet children's movie um and and i think that i love everything that i'm hearing about this i love it and i'm i'm totally i'm totally in i just hope to be honest with you i just hope that rob marshall makes a good movie because I don't think he's made one in a long time. Since I don't what? think he's made one Chicago? since Chicago. Chicago and even Chicago I don't know how well it holds up. I mean I like it but I like it less now than I did the first time I saw it. Okay. So um, and nine is a atrocious I think and <laughs> has great performances though and um, and Into the Woods like you were saying I mean I don't think the movie is great but the performances are great so you know I really really hope that this is the one that like that that's that sings there better be some animated <laughs> penguins in it though right? I, i'm not too familiar with the mary poppins books how dark does it get I mean, well i think it's just not starts as out as in the fourth circle of hell i believe <laughs> no, I mean, and she flies <laughs> is, she like, is she doing smack or something like what, what's yeah. going on i think she's not as nice as like, julie andrews mm -hmm. she's not sitting there going oh i'm just cute and i'm a little sassy i think she is she can be kind of mean no it, well it's hard to be that sweet when you're turning tricks on the corner <laughs> Hollywood 
Boulevard, which is where the Mary Poppins is novel that, takes place. Okay. It's kind of like uh, Flowers in the Attic, where she locks the kids yeah. in the attic, and then the kids basically just have to plot a way to kill Mary Poppins. I, I didn't read it word for word. I'm pretty sure that's yeah. how it goes. Though. And, she's tying, yeah. and she's tying one off in, in the bathroom. Right, right. Oh, yeah. And then James Conn gets in a car accident, and she brings him into her house, and she clubs his feet. It's like This has gone off the rails. Yes. This is officially... Uh, <laughs> Sinead, what do you think about this news? Um, I mean... I, I'm kind of with you where I like Mary Poppins so much that I don't I don't think it's necessary um, to make a sequel. But at the same time, also, like, eventually these beloved stories, people are going to want a new story. And this will hopefully be good. I also did not enjoy Into the Woods as much as I thought I, did, I, thought I was going to because I really love the the musical like itself i saw it and i was kind of disappointed so i mean hopefully it's good i love mary poppins so i'm willing to give it a chance all right unlike mary poppins hater yeah seriously there. i'll Gosh. see it i mean julie <laughs> yeah, yeah. i got nothing for love for you <laughs> all right what's next <laughs> One of the most rumored and longest discussed sequels in recent memories has to be for Beetlejuice 2. As time has gone on and the major players from the movie get more and more busy, the chances of the movie actually happening seems unlikely. And now, thanks to some comments made by original Beetlejuice star Michael Keaton, it's sounding even more improbable. Speaking with Variety, Keaton revealed that he knows zero about the possible sequel. Speaking about the movie and its chances, he said, you always hear things that this is happening and people seem to know more about it than I do. It's possible that ship has sailed. The only way to do it is to do it right. So much of it, so much of it was improvised and so much was beautifully handmade by the artist that is Tim Burton. If you can't get close to that, you leave it alone. There are certain movies that are like Indian burial grounds. You never ride over them. Bad shit happens. If you cross that, you don't <laughs> touch certain things. They are sacred. Whether this means a Beetlejuice 2 movie is now officially dead in the water remains to be seen. Clark, do you buy or sell a Beetlejuice sequel ever getting off the ground? I mean, I sell a Beetlejuice sequel. I I am not on board with this. Now, I'm not saying I would boycott it out of principle, but I agree with everything Michael Keaton said. And I think what he's also saying is, look, Winona said, yeah, I'd do it, sure. Tim Burton said, yeah, I'd do it, sure. And Michael Keaton said, yeah, I'd do it, sure. But I don't think that that equates a movie, mm -hmm. right? And I think that, you know, the enthusiasm is great, but I, I don't think that that was ever particularly real. I know Seth Graham Smith was writing a screenplay at one point, but, you know, it sounds like Keaton didn't even see a screenplay at any point. So I think that's that's how far along in this stage that we actually got. But I know it, it's not. I know it sounds like I'm contradicting myself when I say, yay, more Mary Poppins, no thank you, more Beatles. Juice. But the thing is, Mary Poppins has source material. Mary Poppins has books and books and books to go off of. Beetlejuice is this wonderful, original, crazy, harebrained thing that a young Tim Burton started drawing when he was a child. And and as Michael Keaton said, they improvised and, and it was just, it was an experiment that worked. And I think that's fabulous. But that doesn't mean that there's more to do there. Whether that's Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian or Beetlejuice 2018, like it, it, we don't need it. And so so I'm sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but no Beetle. I don't want a Beetlejuice sequel. I want to have the original, and that's enough. Maybe do a Beetlejuice comic book or something. Like whatever. But why do we need another movie? I don't think we do. So I'm kind of indifferent in whether like I want one or not. But I will sell that, that we're ever going to see one. I mean, like you said, it's it's all these people like Tim Burton, one well, writer, and Michael Keaton saying, yeah, sure they do it. But what? You know, to make these movies, you need money. Studios need to back it up. And it, uh, there's been like this long run of these sequels after many, many years. We just had Zoolander 2 bomb. We just had Independence Day Resurgence bomb. Like studios are looking at it and going, you know what? Not all these properties, even though they kind of have a cult following or even if they're beloved, are really ripe for bringing back because the audiences don't seem to care. Mark? People wanted to love those, though. They and wanted they to, yeah, but they weren't terrible. They, yeah. Like, if you make Beetlejuice 2 right, then people are going but to what are go the chances see of, it. Of that? Here's the good news, is that I, I buy that you're going to eventually get a Beetlejuice sequel, whether we want it or not. The great news is that we have a very clear litmus test as to whether that movie's going to be good or not, and it hinges on whether Michael Keaton is involved in it. Because they could go off and do a Beetlejuice 2 without Michael Keaton. If that's the case, I am totally with Clark and selling that that movie needs to be made. 
But if a guy like Michael Keaton, who does not need to come back to Beetlejuice, he has a great career. He's, he's, he's had a great second or third win in his life acting. He does not need this unless it is totally right to do. So if Michael Keaton does it, then we have a lot of potential there. If Winona Ryder comes back and Tim Burton comes back, but no Michael Keaton, that's when it gets very, very nerve-wracking for me. I think regardless of whether he's involved or not, you are going to see Beetlejuice too. The only way I want to see it is if Michael Keaton's involved somehow. Okay. Sinead, would you want to see Beetlejuice too? Um, I mean, again, I don't think we need it. I would give it the chance if it came out with Michael Keaton, but his comments give me confidence as well, like moving forward, that he said it's st- like... Some movies are like burial grounds. You don't touch them. And if you can't get close to it, you don't do it. So that gives me confidence because I feel like if he was like, all right, we're doing it, I feel like we could get excited. There's actors that just love being in movies like all the time, right? Yeah. And as much as I love Jeff Goldblum, like him coming back to Independence Day, I wasn't like, oh, okay, now it's going to be good. You know, I wanted it to be good, so I was rooting for it. But Michael Keaton is that rarest of rare actors where they backed up a dump truck of money to get him to be Batman again in a third Batman movie. And he said, no, he said, no, I just don't want to do this anymore. So he always puts artistic principle over what it's it, something could do with the box office or how much money he could make. So I trust that dude. If he's going to be in Beetlejuice too, then that movie's going to be good. I'm always going to have a grudge against Independence Day resurgence because I, I rang in my 40s with that movie. You know, that like, was oh, yeah. your 40th yeah, birthday. No, as we were in the theater, yeah. I turned 40. It's and the, I was like, the night I was like, this is how it starts, <laughs> man. Like, I need to turn back time. Dennis, can I tell you something? Yeah. In that theater that night, we all turned 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all Aww. right. What's the last buy or sell? Universal Pictures and Legendary have released the first trailer for The Great Wall. Directed by Hero and House of Flying Daggers director Zhang Jimu, the film stars Matt Damon and tells the story behind why The Great Wall of China was built in the first place. Set 1,000 years in the past, an elite force makes a valiant stand for humanity atop the massive wall, which is constructed to keep out a beast of monstrous proportions. To coincide with the released trailer, EW also revealed a number of images that set up the movie. The movie is written by Carlo Bernard, Doug Miro, and Tony Gilroy, Roy, and also stars Zhang Tian, Pedro Pascal, Willem Dafoe, Han Yu Zhang, Eddie Peng, Lu Han, and Kenny Lin. The Great Wall opens in 3D on February 17th, 2017. Mark, do you buy or sell the new trailer for The Great Wall? Oh boy, do I buy this as much as every history professor is going to sell it. <laughs> this trailer is awesome. And for the first 30 seconds, I had a lot of questions. I was like, wait, wait, okay, so they are building a Great Wall. I, I know a little bit of the history. Why is Matt Damon there? Why do they have some... Why is there a white dude that's helping them build the Great Wall? What's going on here? Is this a history portrayal of how the Great Wall was actually built? Or is it something else? And right as I had that thought, I saw a monster. I saw a lizard snatch somebody (laughs) and pull them over the wall. And I was like, I don't care about reality anymore. (laughs) I just want to see what the hell these creatures are and why we need to build this wall to protect it. That's right, kids. Forget everything you learned. The reason why the Great Wall of China was built was because there's Godzilla lizards everywhere. (laughs) And we got to get on top of them. Clark? I echo Mark's sentiments completely. I throw the history book out the window and say history would have been a lot more interesting if monsters were involved. Um, (laughs) And I love this trailer as well. Um, You know, for for Matt Damon, I think he you know he looks cool. And um, and also you know I think the movie looks beautiful. I'm I'm very excited. So yeah, I totally buy it. Well, I'm going to be going the opposite of you guys. I really wanted to buy this, and I'm, I'm selling. I mean, Matt Damon, I, I love Matt Damon. I think he's one of the most talented actors today. Zhang Zimu is one of the most visionary directors. Mm-hmm. But watching this trailer, I didn't get that, that visual stunning that, like, that I usually see from his movies, like with Hero and House of the Flying Daggers. And then, you know, uh, you know he directed the opening ceremonies for uh, the 20, 2008 Summer Olympics in mm-hmm. Beijing. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. And then when I saw this trailer, just maybe because it's not done yet, but like the CG kind of looked it like did look, unfin- It did look a little CG. Yeah. Some of the shots to me weren't like totally right. I don't know. Maybe there's more to this movie that I just haven't seen yet. But for me, I just... I couldn't buy into it. Again, Dennis, I reiterate, giant lizards, okay? There's giant lizards. We got to see, when he snatched the dude off, it was like, yeah, it was a little CG, but then when you just see like that foot, like this, it was just like a, it was like a talon. 
like a long, like long toenails and stuff. Oh man, we Monsters got this. Is gonna, okay. And this Monsters. movie comes out. This movie comes out February seventeenth of Valentine's next year. Valentine's Day. That's a, get your dates. Get your best guy <laughs> or your best gal and go see a romantic movie, The Great Wall. You, Mark, you just described my perfect Valentine's Day. It is Monster going to be movies. awesome. We're all going to be there together because it's February. It's not always the best time for movies, but I guarantee you, we're going to have more fun at this than Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. All right, guys. Now on to our weekly Friday segment, uh, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is the portion of the show where we try and predict the top five movies this weekend. Mark, what do you got up there? Oh, man, it's a tough one, Dennis, because coming out in theaters, we do have Jason Bourne. And so I think there's enough of a clamor to see Matt Damon back as that iconic action spy thriller dude that I'm going to give that the number one spot. Right behind it is going to be Star Trek Beyond. I have that coming in at number two. As much as I laughed at Bad Moms, I don't think it's going to be able to overtake Secret Life of Pets. So I got Secret Life of Pets at three. I'm going to have Bad Moms at four and then we're gonna have ghostbusters rounding out the top five nerve is something that's getting interesting reviews i just don't think it's going to be in enough theaters to crack the top five clark yeah so mark you and i are almost exactly the same except i think that trek is going to slightly edge out jason Bourne. Ooh. so i'm gonna do uh i'm gonna do trek born secret life of pets bad moms ghostbusters Okay, I have Jason Bourne number one, Star Trek Beyond number two, which I still need to see. Everyone says it, it's actually pretty you good. You and I both, we should go check that out, Thank man. Thank God, we're busy, busy people. Um, Bad Moms, I, I actually have it number three. You had Bad Moms, what, four? I had Bad Moms after Secret Life of okay. Pets, yeah. I had Secret Life of Pets at four, and then I'm, I'm thinking maybe Lights Out will still have good word of mouth and stick in oh, at number four. Totally forgot about Lights Out. Oh, dare I go Damn against it. my Damn Lights it. Out? Yeah. Yeah. Totally forgot about Lights Out. I'm. I'm gonna knock Ghostbusters out of the top yep. five. Okay. And I out agree. I changed to go. I changed the lights out. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, mean. actually, you know what? Here's the real prediction, though, is that I am also predicting because we have a certain matchup coming later on today that somebody at this panel is going to be intrinsically involved in. So everybody out there want to know what you guys think because we have the matchup for the number one contender spot in the movie trivia showdown. Classy Clark Wolf going up against Sam Levine. I, I know that you're you're thinking about it right now. I actually think that Clark Wolf is going down. I'm oh, sorry to say this, but man. I cannot go back. I think Sam Levine is the savant of savants when it comes to movie trivia. It's nothing against betrayal. you. Betrayal. Oh, oh, betrayal. Clark, we have similar top fives. We're going to go see The Great Wall together next year, totally. okay? But I think that Sam Levine is just too powerful of a force. Dennis, what say you? Uh, I'm Clark Wolf. Uh, I'm Thank team you, Cl Dennis. Team Wolf all the way. I think she's going to take this, beat, beat Sam Levine, who's actually really, really good at this, mm -hmm. and then and take on Dan Merle and beat him as well and take that belt home for Collider. Sinead, you're the tiebreaker. Sam Levine, Clark Wolf today. Who you it's got? It's obviously Clark Wolf. Oh, no. thank you, Sinead. Yeah. Mark. Oh, hey, look, I, I'm not saying I'm not rooting for you. I just think <laughs> Sam is going to be able to edge you up. Make sure you guys check that out right here at Collider Video around 2 p.m. today. All right, before we get into mailbag, let's check in with Wendy and see what people are saying about some of our topics. Mark Ellis, I think you are wrong. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Wendy. You're the lone wolf sitting up there because I am also on Team Clark Wolf. Thank you, Wendy. And Mary home. Poppins is stupid. Shame on you. Why do you hate women, Mark? And I hate oh, the no. Wonder, Wonder hate Woman trailer. Why do you hate women so much? I mean, Wonder Woman, oh, Mary boy. Poppins, Sam Levine is your boy. Come on. Yeah. Losing right. fans over there, Ellis? A little bit? <laughs> no? Let's see your face. Your, uh, <laughs> no? Okay. All right, moving on to uh, Chris Evans <laughs> joining Lionsgate's adaptation of Jacko. It looks like the chat's very interested in seeing Chris Evans in this role and that Universal is killing it with their casting. Though some are wondering if Evans can really pull this off since his main success really just comes from Captain America. Tyrus QW says, okay, I thought this was part of the monster movie franchise. Still love the sound of this. Really nice counter character to his Captain America portrayal. And for our buy or sell section, Michael Keaton talking about Beetlejuice 2 is unlikely. I guess the chat is, has turned Oracle today because they pretty much saw this coming. And they agree that the ship has sailed on this. Jonathan Carroll says, I'm going to sell the unlikely news for Beetlejuice for a few reasons. One, it's best to leave Beetlejuice alone. Great film on its own. And two, Keaton is on a great streak of films right now. All right. Thank you, Wendy, for relaying the chat's feelings about those subjects. Now we're on to Mailbag. Remember, you can send us uh, your questions to collidervideo at gmail.com. We can answer them here on our daily movie talk show or on our weekend show, Collider Mailbag. Sinead, what do we got first? 
Brian Knight writes, Collider Movie Talk. Most movies released today on Blu-ray comes with an audio commentary. My question is, what is your favorite classic movie that you would like to have with an audio commentary with the original stars and director? My first choice would be John Campion's favorite, Megaforce. But unfortunately, Hal Needham passed away last year. My real choice would be any Clint Eastwood movie, especially Kelly's Heroes with Don Rickles and Dirty Harry. Go ahead and make my day without negative waves. <laughs> Clark, uh, what classic movie would you like to hear some commentary for? I would like, so one of my top five favorite movies of all time is a Charlie Chaplin movie called The Great Dictator. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this movie so much. It was the first one where the tramp actually talks and uh, and Chaplin directed and wrote it, obviously, and starred in it. And uh, and I just think it was came at such an interesting time in the world. It had so much to say, but it was also, and it was controversial. Uh, and it's also very funny to this day. So um, I would love if I could go into a time machine I would love a director's commentary cast commentary with the Charlie Chaplin and the team of the great dictator because nerds <laughs> <laughs> for me it'd be a bunch of different movies but one it's not even really my one of my favorites but it's interesting story behind is, is Roman Holiday with the director William Wyler and Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn I think originally uh, William Wyler wanted uh, Cary Grant in the in the title role, and then also at that time Audrey Hepburn wasn't the big star that she eventually became. She was kind of an up and comer, and Gregory Peck had um, like in his contract that he was going to get single billing, and he was the one who actually told them, "Hey, let's get Audrey Hepburn up there and, and kind of a co-billing with mm -hmm. him." So I want to, you know, and they shot in Rome as well, which is kind of magical. So hearing kind of the stories about that, I think would be interesting. I would be really up for uh, anything that Marlon Brando ever did because he just got so deep into his role. So if we could have Marlon Brando doing a commentary on The Godfather, that would be incredible. Or Stanley Kubrick doing a commentary on 2001, A Space Odyssey. All of his movies are, are so singular and unique, but I really want to get some more insight into how he looked at making that movie. A Kubrick's a good one. Uh, Clockwork Orange, I'd love to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Blu-ray now has Malcolm McDowell as he is now, like his age now, talking about it. But I'd love to have, if Stanley Kubrick was still alive, maybe those two talking about that film. Because Malcolm McDowell was so young when he mm -hmm. first did that film. And, and I, I remember a story of like Malcolm McDowell became close with Kubrick, and he thought after the movie was done that they would stay in touch and be friends and like it, for Kubrick it was like oh we're done with the movie see you later <laughs> yeah. and he moves on to his next thing oh you know speaking of Kubrick how about the last movie that Kubrick did Eyes Wide Shut yes. but let's get Nicole Kidman and Tom oh. Cruise in the same room to commentate on it that would be epic it'd be very uncomfortable and I'd yeah. love every well, why don't you it. just throw Katie Holmes in there just because yes yes let's get Katie Holmes in there let's get a Penelope Cruz in yeah. there let's get uh, every let's get Kelly McGillis in there let's just have a whole bevy of people that have slept with each other <laughs> allegedly at one point in their lives <laughs> all right guys that's <laughs> it for mailbag we're going to move on to live twitter questions you can tweet us at collider video and Sinead will pick out a few Sinead what do we got first all right Wyatt asks what western movie do you most enjoy for me it's tombstone uh for me western strangely for me was something I got into later in life I remember when I was younger, I thought Westerns were cheesy and bad and terrible. And it was like, you know, the tassels and just like talking funny. Then later I, you know, I saw two movies, <clears throat> Tombstone and Unforgiven that kind of changed my mind about Westerns. And now I love Westerns. So for me, my all time favorite is Unforgiven. Mine is, um, oh, sorry, I cut you off. I cut you off with your, Oh, this did is, I do that? This is why you, no, 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 no. This is why you're not voting for it's me. It's like on passive, the, uh, passive uh, aggressive. No, please. No, I please. am nothing if not a gentleman, <laughs> and I will open the door for the lady. And if there was a puddle, I would take off my coat and put it on there so you could but step yeah, on there. But, but you can't root for them. No, 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 no. Because the girls in their tiny no, brains. No, I mean, God, come on. No. They, they, yeah. don't, they don't know anything yeah. about movies. What Western would you like? <laughs> uh, 310 to Yuma, the remake. Oh, Christian Bale and 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 Russell Crowe. I And Ben Foster. Ugh. I love that movie. I love it so much. And I'm not a huge fan of Westerns. And then there was a new one that just came out called The Keeping Room uh, with Haley Steinfeld and, um, oh God, I'm blanking on her name right now, but that's a really, really good one too. Yeah, I love Westerns. I majored in horsemanship in college, and I'm going to go all the way back to High Noon is one of my all-time favorites. Such a simple premise, and it just still holds up so well to this day. One of the DVD commentaries from the previous question I would still love to see is John Wayne talking about any of his roles, particularly in The Searchers, which was later in his career, but it's just such a great Western. Pale Rider, I think, is the best Clint Eastwood Western of all time, even better than The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And as far as more of a silly popcorn one that I grew up 
with, I'm going to go with Young Guns 2. I absolutely <laughs> love it. You'd love a soundtrack to that oh, as well. Oh, I love Bon Jovi. Okay. All right. What's next? Um, our favorite Olympian, Cody Miller, tweets in, which is more iconic, Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice or Michael Keaton as Batman? Keaton as <laughs> Beetlejuice. <laughs> oh, damn. I'm That's a good go, one. I'm going to go Keaton as Beetlejuice because it was a role that he created. I mean, mm. that character is him and he is that character. And as he even said in that quote we read earlier, there was a lot of improvisation involved and um, what you see of Beetlejuice is mostly Keaton. So I'm going to go Beetlejuice. Just to keep up appearances, I'll argue with you. And <laughs> I will say Batman. I think Beetlejuice is one of the great performances of all time. But as far as iconic goes, there's nothing like the hype, the mania that was surrounding 1989 Batman. And whereas Superman in 1978 was a, it was a cool movie, it was nice to get that franchise. Batman kicked in a new generation of comic book movies, a new generation of comic book fans into the mainstream. Michael Keaton was an unconventional choice to play Batman. It made huge headlines, and I think it paid huge dividends. So ever so slightly, the fact that Beetlejuice is even in the conversation shows what an accomplishment that movie is and how great Michael Keaton was in that role. I'm just going to give the slight edge to Batman because he's freaking Batman. Yeah, and Beetlejuice is, he's the only one who's portrayed that character. So, you know, it's obviously iconic and, and tied to him where Batman has been portrayed by, you know, a bunch of different people. But personally, it's still Batman just because the 1989 version that Tim Burton did is like, I was obsessed with that movie when it came out. Like, I loved everything Batman. I wanted to, like, watch that movie over and over again. I couldn't wait for the sequel. Like, mm -hmm. and so his, his portrayal as, as Bruce Wayne and Batman, it, it will always be stuck in my head. Uh, what about you, Sinead? Which one? Which one of those two is most more iconic? It's got to be Batman for me too. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right. Uh, any reason? Um, well, I think I think you said it perfectly. We've seen a bunch of interpretations of of Batman, where we've only seen one interpretation of of Beetlejuice. That's like that is Michael mm -hmm. Keaton. Whereas, like of all the interpretations we've seen of Batman, I still look at Michael Keaton, and I still sometimes I'm like, damn, like that's my Batman, and I love that movie. Yeah, Love and Be Beetlejuice is one of those things too. Where as much as I love him as Beetlejuice, it's 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 kind of like Jaws for me. Where w when I think of Jaws, the first thing I think of isn't actually the shark. It's the three guys yeah, yeah. who get on the boat and go out. Whereas with Beetlejuice, the first thing I think of when I think Beetlejuice is actually the Dietzes and how funny they are. I know not everybody's like that, but I think of either the Dietzes or I think of Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis in that movie. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, Michael, if you guys haven't seen Beetlejuice in a minute, put it in. It is just as funny and just as dark, scary at the same time. It's a perfect movie. All right, what's next? Sebastian tweets, which factor makes a movie foreign? Is it the language or where the money comes from? And I'm with hashtag Team Wolf. Oh, oh. good smart man. Uh, <laughs> from my understanding, I think it's where the money comes from and not where it's set. It's, it's more of like, so if the money comes, if they make a movie that's set in America, but the money comes from, let's say, the UK, I, I think that's considered a foreign film. Am, am I... Uh, it might be a primary financing situation yeah. too, because like, I, I even think the uh, I think maybe the newborn movie and there's there's been movies that have been partially funded by foreign companies, yes. but it's got it's either the primary financier or it's obviously if it's if it's filmed in a different language that's the easiest you know it change to make, but um, yeah, it's not necessarily just where the money comes from. I think it's how much money or who the primary um, the supporter of the film is. Yeah, I'm thinking about like studios because you know like a like for instance Alfred Hitchcock is an English director but he worked in the in the British mm -hmm. film industry and that so those movies are not if you're talking about from America's mm -hmm. perspective they are technically foreign mm -hmm. films I uh, guess. Yeah. Um but uh yeah, I think I think it I agree. I think it's the I think it's the money. Yeah, yeah money I think it, I think as far as the Academy of uh, mm -hmm. Arts and Sciences goes, it might even be best foreign language film. I'm not sure about that, but I think that they might need the language thing mm -hmm. to factor into a foreign movie. I mean, look, a lot of movies that we see that clearly t take place in America and have American stars in them are filmed elsewhere, filmed in Canada or they are filmed all over the world. So you can't go as easy as, oh, where to the production center? Because sometimes just for the tax break, you want to go to you know, Vancouver or somewhere else. Yeah, everything's being shot in Canada nowadays. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're all, all right. really Canadian. <laughs> all right, let's do two more. Elliot tweets, Bad Moms has great chemistry with the actresses. What are some movies with the best group chemistry? Ooh. Oh, 
man, that's I'll, tough. I'll take another comedy that I think Bad Moms was emulating. That it didn't live up to this, but Bad Moms is still pretty damn funny. That's Bridesmaids. I love the way that cast interacted together. It was a great ensemble, and I think the all-time best comedy that has a a great cast that has it, it brought rowdiness to the forefront. It showed what a raunchy comedy could be was Animal House because everybody in that movie, everybody in the Delta House, everybody on the periphery is just so great in their individual roles. It all adds up to even more than the sum of its parts. I'm going to go Fish Called Wanda. Oh, love that movie. Uh, yeah, that's a great cast with great, great, great chemistry. When they're all together, it's it's magic. I love them all together. Uh, old school for me with Will Ferrell, Vince mm -hmm. Vaughn, and uh, Luke Wilson. Uh, that one's... Uh, people kind of forget that kind of restarted that kind of raunchy R-rated comedy era because every, now everything's kind of like with the Judd Apatows and, and Paul Feig. But back then, like there there was kind of like a run of like... Like it was mostly PG-13 uh, comedies, and then that came out, and it kind of started the whole thing. Yeah, Ocean's Eleven is another, you know, the, the easy chemistry. one to cherry pick, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, last one. All right, Terry tweets, hey, guys, love the show. So have you ever seen a movie and thought it was your original idea? Like, that's my movie. Oh, it's like, a, like the story's about us? Yeah, like, or no, or just like, have you ever seen a movie? He's asking, like, have you ever thought of a plot and seen it transpire on screen? Oh, man, no, there's not a whole lot of original thoughts that pop in here. Uh, there's not, not a lot of great premises make it through these airwaves. But, uh, yeah, I've never seen a movie and been like, oh, I thought of that. I wish I had gotten that on paper first. I'm just a dummy that likes popcorn. I don't know if, like, whole ideas, but maybe, like, certain, like, elements of stories. I have, like, hey, I thought about that before, and then it happened in a movie. But maybe not a whole, like, the whole movie. Oh, no, wait, I take it back. Inception. I totally wrote oh, okay. Inception. I totally had the dream, and then I went to go see Christopher Nolan's, <laughs> and it's like... Psst, and he passed before. on it, and then later you saw the movie. <laughs> Dude. Clark, any I, anything? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't, I don't have any good ideas Well, either. every every kid of a certain generation that would be mine uh, grew up and said, man, you know what? Like, Terminator's awesome. Rambo's awesome. Wouldn't it be crazy if we got all these super action stars together in a movie and they went on a mission? And then, lo and behold, if you pray long and hard enough, kids, miracles happen, and we got the Expendables. There you go. Yes, and when people are desperate for money. Yes, <laughs> as yeah, well. When old people are desperate for money. <laughs> all right, guys, that's it for today's show. I want to thank the people who join us here on the panel. Clark, where can people find you besides the Schmodown match later today? <laughs> you can find me fighting Sam Levine later today and fighting Mark Ellis behind the scenes. <laughs> and uh, you can also find me uh, IRL this weekend at the Midsummer Scream, which is a Halloween convention at Long Be in Long Beach. I'm moderating two panels, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. If you want to buy tickets, uh, use the code Collider and you get 30% off. And you also host a show here. I, and I was just about to get to that. So I'm also, uh, you can find me on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Collider Nightmares. We talk all things genre, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, to see movies, TV, sometimes games, sometimes comics. So check it out. We'd love to have you. Uh, Mark Ellis? I will be moderating my men's support group <laughs> panel in Terminal 4 of Los Angeles' International Airport tomorrow. Uh, a couple weeks, you guys can catch me doing stand-up in Northern California, both in Sacramento and in San Francisco on back-to-back -back weekends at Mark Ellis Live. And once again, make sure you guys check out the movie trivia schmodown with somebody named Clark Wolf mm -hmm. going up against my pick for the winner, <laughs> Sam Levine. It's on Collider Video a little bit later today. And Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries. I'll be in Vegas this weekend, not doing anything movie Whoa. related, but not before I'm on Mailbag and on Mondays, catch me on Collider TV Talk. And Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram. I'll try that again. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And there's Clark Wolf <laughs> looking at her phone <laughs> before the show's away. over, but whatever, you know, it's She's cool. Studying. It's, it's all good. It's I'm all good. I'm prepping for the match. Uh -huh. I'm prepping sure, for the match. Sure. She's like, oh, I'm done. Bye. Clark, <laughs> Clark, are you on this Pokemon Go thing? Is, is that what no. you're doing? Are you trying to capture no? all these things? No. Maybe. Okay. Anyways, you can find me on Twitter at Think Here on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. You'll find me here on Mondays and Fridays on Movie Talk and on Saturdays, Mailbag. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.